at 7.30 in the morning and Hangar 990 at Ellington Airport outside Houston, Texas is buzzing with excitement. We're gonna push and push it that way. Any last questions for what we're going to be doing today? OK, thank you. See you at the jet. From a distance, our plane looks like any other. But close up, you could see it's anything but. I'm minutes away from boarding this plane with a bunch of NASA experimentalists. This is a modified DC-8 with about 28 different instruments on the outside, all trying to measure the pollution and the atmosphere. It's a three-pronged attack. Besides the DC-8, NASA launches a Learjet and an ER-2, modeled after the U-2 spy plane. The ER-2 mission is a sight to see. Everything about it has the feeling of a flight to space. The men who fly the plane undergo special training and wear a pressurized flight suit. The plane can reach heights of 70,000 feet. Several weather probes collect the information and beam it back to Earth. Get seated, door closed. The men and women are learning more about climate change and the role humans play in it. All people are strapped to their chairs. OK, Roger that. We're ready for taxi. Hey, you got 40 pounds. Start valve open, 30 pounds. It's 9 AM. Everyone's seated, and it's wheels up. On board, it's like a candy shop of technology inside this flying laboratory. They've got all the high-tech tools, from lasers to spectrometers and canisters with gases, everything used to measure the chemistry in the sky. What do I anticipate our altitudes to be in the next 15 minutes in the cell? We would keep the man at the center of it all, what, what mission director range? Walt Klein. Why is this mission so important? Because if we don't do anything about it, we're just going to continue on wrecking the Earth. And the job on the plane is to conduct the symphony of the science on the aircraft, uh, making sure that the scientists are getting what they need, when they want it, how they want it, and also making sure we're doing it safely. Each station will try to solve a small piece of the big atmospheric puzzle, and all three planes take readings at the same spots at different heights. The mission is called SEEKERS, short for Studies of Emissions and Atmospheric Composition, Clouds, and Climate Coupling by Regional Surveys. I was just exporting only the colors of the radar to them. On the ground, dozens of scientists monitor the flights in mission control. They can track the flight paths through radar. They can also communicate with the planes from mission control. One of them is Jasna Velovich, a research scientist at Harvard University. Our instrument flies on the ER-2. Almost no other plane is capable of reaching high altitudes. We have remote sensors that allow us to look at the chemical composition of the atmosphere, uh, the outflow of convective activity. We're also interested in looking at the effects of hurricanes. Even higher up in space, a fleet of formation flying satellites pass over the region where the planes fly. We just took off an hour ago and the scientists went right to work. All sorts of instruments that are doing some really incredible science. We have several missions for today. One of the first things we're doing is flying over the Gulf of Mexico. There, we're going to be testing convection in the clouds and measuring the pollution. Another thing that makes this flight different, the passengers are in charge. In that direction, but what we'd really like to do is go a little bit to the west of that. They tell the crew where they want to go and at what altitude, sometimes flying over the same area several times. An aircraft, unlike a satellite, is steerable. We can find a structure and repeatedly fly over it manually and really, really get to know on the micro level over a broad area of ground of what's happening. We're flying right into clouds and storms. It's a bumpy ride with lots of turbulence. OK, yeah, if everybody uh, grab, a, grab a seat for the next couple of minutes. Looks like there's some clouds and bumps coming up ahead. But if there's little puffy clouds around it, it'd be great to fly through those. The first person to catch our attention is principal investigator Jack Dibb, and he means business. He runs back and forth around his station like a madman. Up there, there's a hole in the front of the plane or on top of the plane, these inlets. So it's a specially designed inlet where it's got a small hole that is expands to come through the wall of the airplane. What are you collecting there? We're collecting any particle that's bigger than about five microns. So what is that? 
which no, means what we're measuring the ions that are in the in those particles. So they tell us things about different kind of pollution or sea salt or dust. And Dib doesn't like what he's finding. The results you guys get, does it make you concerned about the future of our climate? I'm not hugely optimistic. More from Dib's findings later, and some of his answers may change your thinking. The Seeker's mission flies three times a week, and so do many of the experimentalists. It is not a flight for everyone. I have a seat right now, got a seatbelt light on, so. The turbulence continues. It's gonna get bumpy over here, it looks like. Seatbelt's on. I even hit my head while I was trying to get back to my seat. There's things that are occurring in the air that you just, you just can't see and couldn't predict. You know, we dropped, dropped like a rock, and then you experience zero Gs. They want people sitting down. Two hours into the mission, and currently flying at just 300 feet over the Gulf of Mexico. At this site, we can fly directly over ships and oil rigs to measure the emissions they're putting into the atmosphere. Perhaps the most important piece of equipment on this mission is the dial laser. I'm seeing a lot here. NASA senior research scientist Syed Ismail operates the laser that shoots up to the top of the atmosphere and at the same time down to the Earth. It measures gases and gets immediate results. So what we are seeing is the distribution of the ozone. Take a closer look. Purple is the lowest intensity, and then it gradually increases with green, blue, and red. Dark red is the highest intensity of these gases. Everybody in their seats, though, just to go quick and dirty as we come back around here. We're experiencing even more turbulence. And I'm also noticing these machines produce lots of heat. And as you can see, it's nearly 90 degrees in the cabin. Nicola Blake's workstation is in the middle of the plane. Today, she will collect more than 150 air samples. She'll ship them back to her lab where they'll be tested for more than 50 gases. So what are we doing to the atmosphere? Well, we're just throwing things into it, you know? We're using it like a trash can. Why are you so pessimistic? Pitch, uh, porpoise, and roll for the MMS maneuver, and uh, we'll climb. Okay, I like everybody in their seats right now. It looks a little bumpy here. Five hours into today's Seekers mission, and we're flying around 20,000 feet. Next, we're going to head out over Texas. We're going to measure the methane levels over fracking fields to see if that's contributing to greenhouse gases. Benjamin Nault operates another laser on board. He gets results of what's in the air over these fields. Now we're flying over a fracking field in Texas, and right here you can see a really good spike of NO2. His research looks at the production of ozone. Why do we need to study fracking more? It's still unknown how much greenhouse gases and other gases are being emitted by the fracking fields. Why is it important to understand the fracking emissions? They can contribute to the greenhouse gases. There's been studies trying to understand this in the Utah and Colorado basins because they've been seeing ozone exceedances during the winter times. We're thinking that's from the fracking fields. The mission takes them all over the country. This is video from the plane's nose cone when it flew over the rim fire in the Sierra Nevadas last summer. It was nasty stuff. Levels of CO, right? We get excited when we see a couple hundred parts per billion change, and we were seeing factors of 1,000 times higher in, right in there. And formaldehyde levels were astronomical. So you wouldn't want to breathe the air? Not for very long. It's bad. I mean, it's a really serious pollutant. Jack Dibb collects particle samples during the Seeker's mission. He's collected thousands in his career, but this day was different. The filters were really dark brown. Could you actually see that with your you eyes? You could easily see were... it, that they were coated, filthy. So there's a lot of black carbon in the smoke and a lot of organic aerosols. Black carbon on some surfaces is actually going to contribute to climate change warming. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being perfect clean air, 1 being just terrible, how bad was it? Over the rim fire, the, uh, the air quality right close to the fire was way higher than probably any urban pollution anywhere on the planet. So is that a three, is that a four? No, it was, it, on a scale of one is terrible, it would be like a minus two or three. 
that bad. So anybody that was there breathing that air would probably have reduced life expectancy. It's like cigarette smoke, just a slew of organic compounds, carcinogens. The research done on this mission will help us understand the atmosphere better and hopefully find ways to keep it cleaner. Next, we're going to be testing the convection of the clouds. We're going to be flying in a slow vortex up to 40,000 feet in order to measure how those emissions vary at different heights. The results don't always come quickly. What are the gases that you guys are finding in there? We always find certain hydrocarbons, um, methane, ethane, all the way up to benzene and toluene. And a lot of those gases come from car exhaust. Why are those so important? They build up over, over many years. Methane has a lifetime of about 10 years. So even if we stopped emitting methane today all over the planet, we would still have a lot of methane. So it's contributing to making the temperatures higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And changing the structure of the atmosphere as well. Syed Ismail operates the dial laser. So what have we learned about climate change? Is it changing? Is it something we should be concerned about? The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is historically is very high. The rate of change is unprecedented. So why should we care about the levels of CO2? We are seeing indications of warming. The melting of the polar ice caps is one indicator. And then even global temperatures from now compared to about 20 years ago are slightly higher. Primary investigator Jack Dibb has some eye-opening scientific opinions. I do not have a rosy outlook for what the state of the world is going to be like in 50 or 100 years. There may be some progress, but I'm, I'm not terribly optimistic. Why are you so pessimistic? Countries like the US, we are tremendously potent emitters of a lot of bad stuff. We are not doing very much to reduce emissions. Dib says the problem could get worse with emerging nations without strong regulations. Global emissions, are those things that you could actually read here while we were flying? We had on previous missions, you definitely see um, stuff coming all the way from Asia, halfway across the US, or sometimes all the way across. Back in the air, after nearly eight hours on one of the most harrowing flights I've been on, it's time to land back in Houston. While the DC-8 and Learjet make standard landings, the ER-2 landing is pretty exciting. Hotel from present position. Departure will be at your own risk. That's mobile. We're in a chase car as the ER-2 gets ready to touch down. To access to Charlie, hold short runway 17 right for recovery. Got a heavy left wing. The chase car is in constant contact with the pilot, helping him keep his balance. Once the plane stops, the pilot gets out and it's back to the hangar to prep for the next yep. flight. Welcome back, man. Thanks. Only on Al Jazeera America. A team of scientists are taking their inspiration from nature. Technology, it's a vital part of who we are. They had some dynamic fire behavior. And what we do. Transcranial direct stimulation. Don't try this at home. Techno's team of experts show you how the miracles of science. This is my selfie. What can you tell me about my future? Can affect and surprise us. Sharks like affection. Catch new episodes of Techno on Al Jazeera America. Check your local listings or visit aljazeera.com.